Hello, South by Southwest. Welcome to How a Video Game Changed the Way We Talk to Patients. I'm Justin Willman. Um, my background, my trade, I'm a magician, okay? But uh, by happenstance, early on in my career, I became affiliated with the hemophilia community and have proudly kind of become a hemophilia advocate. My first show ever was for uh, a hemophilia group when I was 13 in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, somehow opportunities to uh, stay involved and uh, be a, a voice and a mouthpiece for this community have popped up uh, over and over throughout the years. Today, we are going to talk about, um, I think, a unique um, marketing triumph in this field. All brands have those hard to reach consumers. And when your audience is young men, specifically with a rare disease, reaching them can be very tricky. So today you're gonna hear from the lead marketer and the lead creative behind one of the biggest events in online gaming last year, the Bloodless Battle. You're gonna learn how a tournament for people with hemophilia established an unlikely connection between a biotech company and the esports world. And more importantly, you're gonna see how it helped members of a rare disease community find one another. Here's a little clip from the day. Uh, you're gonna see Wave Punk, who is the Rivals host, set up the event. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Twitch Rivals, the show about streamers we love and the games they play. Today, that game is Apex Legends Season 7, I think, is out at this point, and I'm excited to get into the new game with new legends, new maps, everything's new. We're partnering with Genentech today to host a tournament highlighting Twitch's creators that live with hemophilia, a rare blood disorder. There are only about 20,000 people in the United States living with hemophilia, so it can be hard for them to connect with each other. Well, today is all about spotlighting those those members within the Twitch community, bringing them together and showing off their skills. Now, bleeding events are a huge part of life for people with hemophilia, but today we're taking the blood out of the equation to play the bloodless battle and to give us more background on the hemophilia community, let's bring in... So there you go. Now the title makes a little more sense. The bloodless battle. Clever and epic. Throughout the event, uh, I also interspersed some magic here and there. I challenged our... Uh, our Twitch gamers to a little Rubik's Cube solving battle. And you know, I don't need to tell you how it went, but let's just say, um, let's just say I kind of cheated and it went <gasps> very well. I won no. very, very quickly. Magic. <laughs> Witchcraft, or in this case it was, it was Twitchcraft. But this isn't about magic today. Um, and, uh, and, and it's not just about me. I'm very excited to introduce Petra Satmari, who is a marketing director on the hemophilia team at Genentech, as well as Patty Wong, who's the VP and creative director at 21 Grams. Hi, Petra. Hi, Patty. Hey, Justin. Hey, Justin. Hey, everyone. Petra, maybe you can kind of just kick us off by giving us a, a little brief overview of what hemophilia is, the prevalence of the disease, the different stages that people go through. Um, as you saw from our clip just now, hemophilia is a rare bleeding disorder that impacts about 20,000 people in the US, mostly males. Hemophilia is diagnosed at birth, um, so it's a lifelong condition. And as people go through the various stages of their lives, they may have different caregivers helping them along the way. Uh, their attitudes towards their condition tend to change as, as they go through different stages, and so, so do their hobbies and their interests. And because hemophilia is so rare, and not everybody may have a family history of it, um, it's, it's quite possible that some people don't get to meet others with hemophilia all that often. And so there's really a need for some people to, to, to create that sort of connection somehow. Um, from a marketing perspective, we've been fairly successful at tapping into like a large part of this hemophilia community by understanding their different mindsets and their needs and what have you. Uh, but for some reason, we've been a little less successful in reaching and engaging teenagers and young adults specifically. Yeah, so like with any marketing exercise, it's really important to keep your specific audience in mind and reaching teens and young adults, as Petra was just mentioning, is a different challenge kind of in any category. Um, like these are people who don't necessarily consume traditional media or participate in the typical community activities where you think you might find them. You know, they're tech savvy, they know what an ad looks like. So um, we kind of have to go a little bit deeper to reach them. So instead of thinking of them as consumers, we always want to think of them as people first and kind of lean into their interests that way. Tell, tell me, when was the aha moment when you realized, you know, the um, natural aspect of someone who, who has hemophilia of their life is it, a high proportion of, of gaming? And is that kind of... Uh, 
because of because of the disease, avoiding kind of you know outdoor active uh, potentially harmful activities leads to you know a, a large gaming community. What was that moment like? You know, to back up to the challenge, we needed to reach a rare disease population, which is a really small population, um, who weren't showing up at the places where we think we might find them normally. So we're just kind of like, you know, where are they? What are they doing? So if you take a second, like put yourself in their shoes, you're probably a male, a guy, you know, who has hemophilia, so you can't be as active and go out and play sports as much as the average person. So, you know, what would you do in your free time? And like, for me, I'm thinking like, I'd probably play a whole lot of Mario Kart or something like that. So that's how we landed at this insight of um, gaming. And that was our hypothesis. So we kind of went out to test that to see if it was true in the real world. Um, so we did some social listening and some searching. And we found people saying that not only do they game and love gaming, um, but that gaming is one of the ways they cope with their hemophilia, the sort of pain and isolation. And um, it's an outlet for them and even a social outlet. Um, so, you know, this is so true that we even found someone who had made his own site kind of just dedicated to gaming and hemophilia, being a person with hemophilia and using gaming as a way to cope with that. Um, so we definitely knew we were onto something and that sort of validated how intrinsically tied gaming can be to hemophilia. So that connection was real. And so we knew that gaming was where we had to be. So I'm sure people watching are, are wondering, okay, well, how well did this program achieve its goals? And in the end, we ended up with over 1.6 million unique viewers of the tournament, which is a lot, over 26,000 people watching at any given point. So, um, you know, Petra, was that a, a bigger success than you could have imagined? And, and what, do you, what do you kind of make of those numbers? That's one way to put it, for sure, I think. Um, first of all, I mean, those numbers are incredible. Uh, we had a you know, four plus hour long event on Twitch Rivals. Uh, this went on for, for many hours. We were able to have more, as you said, more than 1.6 million total people tune in and watch, which means at any given point in time, there were, you know, 30,000 or even 70,000 people listening. So we had a huge audience and we were so grateful to have such a, a grand audience, I would say, to be able to tell and share our hemophilia story. Um, but beyond those numbers, for us, it was all about making connections between these um, people who love to game and who happen to have hemophilia. We were actually surprised that we found more people like that than we originally thought were out there. And we were able to bring them into this unique game. Um, they played alongside pro gamers. They were able to share their stories and whatnot. And even though people came to watch the gameplay, they started supporting hemophilia in different ways as our program unraveled that day. And they were rooting for our players. There was great engagement in the live chat. Some people actually were like, hey, I have hemophilia. I had no idea we we're gonna talk about this today. Um, and throughout, we were obviously trying to get people to be curious about what we have to you know, offer them for this community. So. We encouraged people to visit our website, genenzakhemophilia.com, and we saw significant increases to that site post-event. And before I let Patty share some of her sort of thoughts on how this achieved our goals, for me personally, it was also just about trying something new and innovative, and the fact that we were able to, to make that happen is a success in and of itself. You hit the nail on the head about the connection point. And to me, that's, you know, a huge point of success as well. Um, and just for like perspective, you know, before we even started this whole thing, we were interviewing gamers with hemophilia and we asked them if they knew other heme gamers. And across the board, largely, the answer was mostly no or very few. Um, so these people had so much in common, but they weren't a community yet. Um, so, you know, not only did we bring eight of them together, but even more of them sort of came out of the woodwork and self-identified as having hemophilia, like Petra mentioned. Um, and people even like just native to Twitch, just watching this program showed up in the chat saying like, wait, I have hemophilia. I can't believe this would be talked about here. Um, and, you know, even after the tournament, these guys are still gaming together. So they really forged a connection that, you know, has, um, has life in the future. Um, so that, that I agree is the biggest success, sort of making that community. And then, you know, for someone tuning into that program uh, who has hemophilia, you really get this feeling that like, wow, that's a game I love to play. 
played by people who are just like me. So it really feels like this whole thing was kind of made for me. Um, and that, that happened here. What I was very impressed by is that um, the balance with which hemophilia was woven into the program, you know, like people were coming to this tournament because they're fans of gaming. Um, you know, not everyone knew the Genentech and, and the Bloodless Battle tie-in tuning in, but at no point did it feel like Oh, this is there's a, there's a lot of extra layers on here. Oh, there's a lot of you know information being fed to me. It was it it felt so natural, and I'm sure that that was a uh, you know a very deliberate choice to make sure that this um, you know because people people can sense like oh this is turning into a PSA or this is this is not what I tuned in for. And at no point did it feel like that. It felt so natural and open and warm and welcoming. What what was the the prep for that? People don't necessarily want to hear from us all the time. You know, nobody wants to feel like they're being sold to. And we already sort of just live in this world of ad blockers and sort of instant entertainment at your fingertips. So um, if we want to reach people, you know, we're not just competing with other ads out there. We're competing with Apex Legends and Fall Guys and, and Netflix. Sorry, Justin. <laughs> so, so that's really the key. Um, we need to be the thing that they want to do and not the interruption to that thing. So that was our whole goal, our whole approach for this thing. So um, one thing we did was we found the biggest stage in esports and gaming, which is Twitch Rivals. And we didn't just go there, like post up and shout our names from the rooftops. We actually went down and built an experience around hemophilia and actually had our target audience play the game they love um, on the biggest stage in esports. So, so that's the kind of thing that, that makes them pay attention. Petra, what have you learned from this whole experience? Um, actually, before I talk about what I learned, I'd love to add on to what Patty was saying about like how we made this, what you mentioned, this magic happen. Mm -hmm. I think it was a very atypical um, activation or maybe 10 years ago, you know, a biotech company would not think to do something like this. But I think today times have changed. People are really just people first and foremost. And then secondarily, they may have a condition, right? Or they may have other things. Um, so for us, the important thing was that we knew, we had intel about these teenagers and young adults. We knew that they weren't really interested in a whole lot of things that we had to say. Um, in fact, they're not even interested in listening to their parents or their doctors either. So that's why we kind of decided to latch on to something that was special to them. They're one of their hobbies, right? This passion for gaming and try to really think hard about how to engage without being forced and without it seeming forced and like not authentic. So I think that was the biggest creative task at hand, which was to figure out how to marry the world of rare disease with gaming. And at the end of it, for people to remember like who's behind it, right? Like. We all know those awesome ads that everybody remembers, but you don't really know what the what they're advertising, right? We didn't want to be that. We wanted to make sure that people understood that we cared about this community and that they were curious enough to to research and 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 learn more about what we have to offer. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like you know, you're not selling you know Coke or Pepsi, so you don't need everybody to remember. It's it's like the people who are specific who you're who you're there to to uh connect with they definitely walked away remembering it and, and it was done with such a light hand which i thought was masterful my favorite thing was reading in the chat um because you know we're, we're normalizing talking about things like hemophilia things that people just don't normally feel comfortable talking about because there's just it's it's you don't want to go into the whole thing people saying like oh, i don't have hemophilia but i i have crohn's and i know exactly what that guy's talking about i, I feel the same way i don't have hemophilia i'm a type 1 diabetic and yes i i can totally relate there was so much relating and uh and just being open about these things that i think people just don't normally get permission to talk about which was which was a, a beautiful thing so Petra, like, what's the what's the takeaway? What'd you what'd you learn, and what what does this uh, how does this affect future endeavors? As marketers, we we just have to remember that we're not the audience. Oftentimes, right? I don't have hemophilia, but I can seek to understand what it's like to live with hemophilia. That's that's the best I can do. I'm also not a gamer. My kids are actually teaching me how to play Among Us right now. So clearly, I'm not a gamer. I'm a wannabe, uh, but I appreciate what a creative outlet this is for so many people and not just people with hemophilia. 
So we got to go where people go. And if that's uncharted territory, then that's where we have to go. And, you know, in terms of the future, I think that's what we're going to have to keep doing. Of course, we'll have, you know, some more non-traditional things as well. And we do have a huge variety in terms of our audience's needs and, and whatnot. But in order to like cut through, as Patty was saying, we have to try new things. We just have to innovate. And I think that's fun as a marketer. I, one thing that I, you know, found out was that you really need to know the platform. Like you're showing up in this world where, you know, it, it's native to all these people who are like on Twitch all the time, playing games every day. Like they're, they're living it. Um, and so you kind of have to think of it like not just a channel, it's like a whole culture and you have to talk to them and know it really, really well before you can sort of create an activation that feels native and that feels natural uh, in that kind of world. Yeah, people can smell an outsider, like, oh, they're a poser, you know, especially in this world where there's a lingo and it's very clear, like, who, who kind of is there to respect why you're there versus, oh, they're clearly here to sell to us, you know, and I'm sure that that was uh, a deep dive into how to handle this in the right way. What, what were both of your highlights of the event? We mentioned it a few times before, but my absolute favorite part was just watching the chat and um, seeing people pop up saying like hemo strong and like, wow, I have hemophilia. I can't believe we're talking about this here. And these are just people who are gamers who are interested in Apex Legend. They came for the show and what they saw was something that was made for them, speaking to them. So that to me is, was amazing. And to hear Wavepunk, the host, really uh, skillfully and thoughtfully you know, set it up and to and to treat it with reverence and and he, he really did a good job, I think, handling it well. And I think when you tune into a show and you see the guy who you see host the show that you love to watch and watch people game actually kind of be on board with this message, it, it really kind of, it, it smooths out the cracks and it just made it a great experience. Also, can I just say wave punk yeah. face palming when you uh, destroyed him at Rubik's Cube? That was also very funny. That was a good moment. <laughs> that was a good moment. That made for a good gif. Petra, what was your highlight? I loved the positive and inspiring messages that our hemophilia gamers shared with one another in this grand audience, as I call it. Um, they talked about the fact that hemophilia is hard, but you know, it's tough, but they're actually tougher. And um, there was another gamer who was saying things like, there's never been a better time to be alive than now. Like how, how inspiring is that? So I loved all of that. And then on a personal note, I actually, um, I was in the same room during the event and I was looking at my window four hours into this show and I realized that the moon had come up. I was like, wow, I've been having so much fun. Like the, you know, time flies and this was so, so really inspiring to watch all this go down. And I got so emotional that actually later that night I wrote a poem a thank you poem to Patty and the Twitch team and everyone else who made it happen. Don't worry, I'm not going to read the poem to you. Oh, but I hear this poem. Maybe <laughs> later, round two or whatever. But like, I I don't write poems for work, but this certainly brought something else out of me that I didn't know maybe, was there. Maybe poetry is a new platform. <laughs> maybe, but I'm not writing them. <laughs> But uh, what you just described, like, that's a real experience. Like, think of how many gamers are just, you know, lost in their game playing. They look up and suddenly it's like seven hours later. Like, that's that's their lives. And, you know, trying to um, be be that thing that they love doing makes all the difference. So I love that inside of the moon. What about so you, Justin? You were with us. What, what was your favorite moment? Well... Um, one of my favorite moments was uh, Devin, one of our heme gamers, who um, you know who I worked with on an episode of Challenge Accepted, which is which is our uh, web series that people can check out, where we kind of explore uh, the different ways that hemophilia uh, people living with hemophilia can really kind of get out of the limitations that they set on themselves in a in a healthy way, and and uh, it's a great show. But Devin is so well spoken. And uh, he really is such a great advocate for his own community. Maybe we can play a, play a little clip from Devin that I think um, says it better than I could. For me, I would invest more in a support system in life. Just find, excuse me, find um, people who I can connect with. Like it, this event has been crazy for me. Like there are things that every person individually, hemophiliac or not, 
goes through that it's hard to find somebody else that has been through that to connect with them. So this is something that I really encourage everybody of all walks of life to do is you have an issue, identify the issue and find somebody that has been through it or know somebody who's been through it. Find that support, talk that out, feel that out so that you can grow as a person and like just feel all around better about life. I love that guy. And, and he's dressed like a penguin and uh, it's just, I, I'm yeah. just a well-spoken <laughs> penguin. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm curious, like, what what is, you know, seeing as what a experiment this was that turned out to be such a fantastic success, what do you think is next in, in the pharma world for reaching and talking to patients in a way that has the tact that this event had? That's a great question. Like, we think about that a lot. Um, I think it's doing things that are similar to what, what we're talking about here today. Uh, doing more unexpected things, things that we you know, maybe in the past we were hesitant to try, but I think the success of this program um, has kind of reiterated in, in me for sure that like, we have to keep doing this. Like this is the future. We have to understand our, our, our you know, um, consumers on a deeper level. We have to think outside of things we've tried in the past. Um, you know, we're, we, we actually noticed that some of our gamers are really into, hemophilia gamers are into music and, Coincidentally, we're working on a song with Patty and her team. And, you know, maybe next year we can talk about that. It might take a while, but that's okay. Like innovation is sometimes hard, but but unless you put the energy into it, like you're not gonna find those those gems. Yeah, I and mean, the things you mentioned, Petra, like they don't sound like ads. They don't feel like marketing. You know what I mean? Like songs, gaming, game tournaments and stuff like that. And I think that's the future. So that, that goes beyond just like meeting them where they're at. You have to find out what they're doing in their free time um, and, and be that thing and not, you know, not the interruption to that thing. So like if they're out there making dance videos of themselves, posting it to TikTok, like get on TikTok and figure out what that's all about. You know, if they're out there watching, playing Apex Legends, um, that's where you have to be too. So it's just really leaning into what they are. What would you say is, you know, for people watching this right now who, you know, maybe are in the marketing world, but not, pharma specifically and not the, the the health field what is the big marketing lesson that i think no matter what the specialty is that you could adapt as a takeaway from uh the bloodless battle tournament i think don't be afraid to be creative and and really just remember you're not the audience oftentimes unless you're working on a product that you yourself use fine but in our case that's not not you know, that's not the case for us. So I would say, lean into what people are telling you, follow the times, get with the program, right? And, and be like, have enough energy to like, convince other people that you have to try these things. And what's the worst thing that can happen? You tried it, and maybe it doesn't work out, but that's okay. Like, at least you've learned and you've tried and you can't, you know, regret that. I think that's awesome. I would I would highly recommend everybody to try something crazy this year that they never thought would cross their minds before. I would say, don't be afraid, period. I think Petra said it all, I totally agree. Listen Good to words. your kids, listen to your kids, <laughs> follow what they're doing. Like, You're gonna have to pay your kids now after saying that. Once they, are, <laughs> they, are, they are technically unpaid consultants. Um, yeah, take risks. Don't be afraid. I think that's the, the big takeaway. This was a uh, great insight. Petra, Patty, thank you so much. I'm Justin Willman. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Thank you.